Let's get started this evening. Thank you all very much for coming. It looks like we have a pretty much a full house this evening. First item of business is a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Actually, um, I don't have one picked out, so can a board member start us, please? I'm looking at, is it good? Thank you. Please stand. Thank you very much, David. All right, next item of business is staff recognitions. Uh, Ms. Aries, welcome. Good evening, President Pingarelli and members of the board. Last week, a number of us in this room had an opportunity to walk through the Challenger Space Center. This is following the district's recent purchase of that building. And for those of you who have been in that building before, you know what it's like to walk through those front doors, maybe even for the first time, and encounter really an incredible sight. There's a balcony when you enter. And it extends, and you are in the center, almost, of a four-story rotunda. And it's encapsulated with a stunning mural by legendary artist Robert McCall. As the district has been discussing plans to purchase and uh, take over that building, inevitably we are always asked, what do you plan to do with that mural? Our response has been unequivocally, well, preserve it, of course. It's a masterpiece. And tonight, we are so pleased to be joined by Beverly Swayman. She's the executive director of the Challenger Space Center, and she is here to officially present the mural to the Peoria Unified School District. She'll be joined by Barbara Coakley, the director of the Met Professional Academy, and Mr. Robert Panzer, our arts education director, and they will officially accept the mural on the district's behalf. I'm gonna ask Mrs. Coakley, Mr. Panzer, if you can uh, head on up to the front here for just a moment. And while you're making your way up there, I'm gonna invite uh, Beverly Swayman to the microphone as I know she has some comments to share on behalf of the Challenger Space Center. First of all, I would like to share what a wonderful privilege this is to stand before you tonight and to thank you for accepting this wonderful legacy that has blessed the community for 17 years. On behalf of our board and our management team, I would like to present a certificate of ownership. This certificate of ownership acknowledges the tour of the universe 360 degree mural by Robert McCall with an estimated value of conservatively $250,000 as a gift to this district. We would like to share with you that this was his last work that he ever did of a 360 degree mural. And so it is a special treasure, especially since he was an Arizona artist and did many wonderful things with NASA movie studios, and his art will continue to live on thanks to projects like this. I felt it would be helpful also to present at the same time a binder that carries the story of this mural panel by panel as he created it. I felt that that would be appropriate since we all share this legacy of education and our goal is to make sure that students have an opportunity to have the experience of not only science, engineering, math, technology, but also art. And so it has been our privilege to be the caretakers of it. And now we thoughtfully and most appreciatively hand it over to you officially. And we want to thank you for this opportunity to be here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. And if we can have you come right to the center here just over a little bit, we'll get an official photo.
Thank you so much, Beverly, and to the entire Challenger Space Center. We really appreciate the partnership that we've had for a number of years and trust we will take very, very good care of that mural. I wanted to also add a quote from Mr. McCall. As he once said, my goal is to document in my drawings and paintings a small part of this changing world and to anticipate in my work the future that lies ahead. And I thought that so fitting given uh, the work to move the Met Professional Academy into that building uh, and what the future really holds for all of the students that will be walking through that building and continuing on uh, to shape the future. So a very big thank you to you and the entire Challenger Space Center. Well, thank you very much. Um, does our board members uh, like to have some comments? Mrs. Doan? I do not. Okay. Mr. Sandoval? Uh, no, agreed. Uh, thank you very much. It's beautiful. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Connect? No, it was a lovely gesture, and Mrs. Airy said everything beautifully. And we're, we're so pleased and honored to have it, and we'll, we will take excellent care of it. Thank you. Yes, and thank you very much again for coming this evening. We will take very good care of it, and uh, uh, I think all of us here have seen it a number of times. Our children have, have been there a number of times, so thank you very much. All right, next item is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, board recognitions. Um, I'll start with Mrs. Connect. Um, yes, ma'am, thank you. Uh, I have been doing some really cool things, but most cool of all was uh, this week at the Veterans Day um, celebrations that many of our elementary schools uh, were able to put on. Uh, each one of them invites veterans from the community to come in and spend some time with the, the, the student and their family and also to share their experiences uh, with the students in the campus. And so, um, I kind of thought, you know, what really stood out with each group, and I would say Foothills had the coolest dance, Sunset Heights had the most amazing, impressive wall of honor, Pioneer had the best poetry, Desert Harbor had the most beautiful singing, and Oasis had the best lunch. So, <laughs> no, it was, they were all wonderful. And, you know, these are projects that are t taken on by teachers that ha just add that to their to-do list to put on this big, expansive community uh, effort um, and to honor our veterans. And it's a wonderful feel-good event, and it was, it was terrific to be able to participate there. Um, I also was a panelist um, at the convention of the Arizona uh, Latino Administrators and Superintendents Association, and the conversation there was about the value of professional educators doing language immersion for themselves, for their own professional development. And I, I had that experience last summer, and I highly recommend it to, to any professionals that are engaging with non-English speaking parents or members of the community, um, how far that goes to foster um, relationships and engagement. And then uh, yesterday was the Teacher of the Year luncheon and another very feel-good event, uh, a room full of people really celebrating the commitment and um, the dedication of selfless educators who, who make this their entire lives to help students and get their bite at the American dream. It's just a wonderful event. And um, the winner, uh, this year's Teacher of the Year, is a PE teacher from, I can't remember. I can't remember either. From Baltz? From Baltz, that's right, from Baltz Elementary. So um, congratulations to him and to Baltz and to all the students whose lives he's touched over the years and will continue to do so. That's all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Doan? I don't have anything this week. Uh, Mr. Sandoval? Yes, so uh, fortunately, um, this morning I, I was able to attend the, the, the Pioneer Veterans Day celebration. Um, I didn't get to enjoy the breakfast, uh, but I did enjoy the um, the recognition by the students for or of the, the veterans um, that uh, were there uh, later in the morning. Uh, I think for me, the the really, I, I guess, uh, inspiring and certainly, uh, um, I guess, component of the morning it was the experience that the students realized 
you know, as they, they wrote poetry, as they made speeches, as they honored individuals, you know, who were very selfless. Um, and, um, and certainly you just saw all the proud faces of all the, the young students that were there who, um, some of them were able to, to actually uh, walk up, you know, their, their relatives to be recognized on, you know, whether it was the Army, you know, Navy, Air Force, Marines. Um, but uh, it, in fact, this morning, one of the, uh, the veterans that was recognized uh, came through or went through the, uh, the halls of PUSD. He was a student at Pioneer, uh, and then a student at Cactus, mm -hmm. and now is in the, uh, in the Army. So that was really neat to see him come back uh, and, uh, and just, uh, you know, just really uh, showed, uh, you know, his uh, gratitude you know, for, for what he realized uh, within the, uh, the PUSD uh, walls again, and certainly, uh, you know, the support and, um, you know, uh, just mentoring that he realized, you know, from our teachers and staff. Uh, in addition to that, um, you know, we did attend, uh, was it a couple weekends ago, or maybe a week ago, the, the Westmark dinner, where, um, you know, Miss you know, Beltran, Patty, you know, was uh, certainly uh, recognized for um, a district, uh, certainly program, our CTE, program that we have. Um, and Patty, help me with this. It was the Quality of Life uh, Award, correct? So uh, just, you know, so many things that I continue to, to realize. And, and uh, as I walk through the halls or, or meet individuals in the community or, you know, attend some of these functions, um, it all ties back to PUSD. Uh, and PUSD is certainly an anchor and certainly the roots you know, of um, a lot of the successes that we realize, you know, as a community, um, as a state, and even as a nation. You know, we, again, we'll never know the impact that we make as educators on our, our, our students and our, on our youth. So, you know, again, as always, you know, my, uh, my board recognition, um, you know, continues to be all the teachers and staff um, that, uh, you know, work tirelessly every day to ensure that our youth are on a path of success. So thank you. Thank you. And again, I apologize. I was driving from Pima and there were at least three accidents on the way. So um, thank you for your patience. I too was uh, busy along with my governing board members. Uh, thank you for highlighting the, the CTE award. Definitely an honor to support you guys. I also had the honor to attend the Arizona Council of Economic Education, where one of our uh, high school teachers was nominated Economics uh, Teacher of the Year. And then I had an opportunity to visit Cheyenne Elementary with Dr. Bell. Uh, Ms. Wallace does a phenomenal job. I got to see personalized learning, blended learning, and capture that those two curriculum instruction initiatives are is what we need to continue to do because there's also differentiating instruction that is applied that has not been discussed so seeing that all in one was definitely a highlight so I appreciate that uh, one little student that cannot capture it best I asked him well what do you like about school what do you like about teach your teacher and he said everything could not have said it better myself. So uh, I appreciate those efforts and I look forward to seeing more so that we can continue that growth and innovation. Thank you. All right, well, I, uh, uh, I was, had the pleasure of going to the CTE event at Centennial High School. Uh, it was in late October, was it? Okay. Uh, it was a very good event. Uh, Mr. Fuller was there from Peoria. Uh, high school, so uh, it was a great time, and it was uh, it was extremely crowded. The parking lot was uh, jam packed, so I'm glad to see you had a great turnout this year. Okay. So. Mrs. Pingerly, yes, I apologize. And then this morning, I went to the veterans uh, presentation at Zuni Hills. I know last year you guys all went, or some of you went, and it was definitely hands down phenomenal. The amount of community members that have served in the service is definitely breathtaking, so thank you. And so I wanted to appreciate them for all their hard work, so thank you. All right, uh, next agenda item is a request to address the governing board. And I have several this evening. Um, the first one is Annette McCarty-Abraham. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, President Pingarelli and board members. My name is Annette McCarty Abraham and I'm a Liberty High School parent and I'm also the president of the Peoria United Parent Council. Uh, PUPC 
the acronym, is a district-wide parent group organized to offer parents opportunities to be influ influential in, in uh, the decisions that affect our kids, and that we touch on the broader subjects uh, rather than being the PTSO mom where you might do the fundraiser dinner. The, the PUPC group uh, gives the parents opportunity to have conversations across the district, providing parents with greater access to the administration, district administration, uh, to learn about state level legislation related to educational issues. Um, our next general meeting is November 29th, and we invited Dr. Stiffler to talk to the parents in our group about personalized learning. And we were notified that he has taken a leave of absence. And I'm starting to grow increasingly concerned about the behind the scenes politics in our district. Um, on that, I would like everyone to view a YouTube video of a Peoria community member who's here, Mr. Rick Guttridge, speaking to the Scottsdale Tea Party, where he emphasizes the fact that he um, has his group, the West Valley Republican Group, has filled nine of the last 10 school board seats in PUSD. So a couple things bothered me. First, the school board members are supposedly a nonpartisan position. He lays out the methodology of how to recruit, collect signatures for, and elect board members. When PUPC put on the school board candidates forum last fall prior to the election, the question of political affiliation was asked and denied by all candidates. So who are these board members that he chose to fill the seats? Since the last election, the current clerk nominated the president, the power of these two positions control the agenda. The board members have created a system whereas they appoint committee members to support the majority's political agenda. Um, in, the, in the video, Mr. Guttridge goes on to compare his political agenda to civil war and school districts as territories to take over and then work their way up. If indeed Dr. Stifler has cleaned out his office and gone on leave of absence, or is this the board looking for a way to fire him? The school board will end up hiring his successor and if that's Mr. Getridge's game plan for the Civil War, will that person be beholden to the group? As a mother of two and a conservative, I am concerned about the ide ideology influencing our school district, and we as parents have a duty to see if there's negligence or intentional misconduct in our district. If Mr. Getridge's ideas succeed, I feel like I've failed to do my duty and I appreciate you letting me express those thoughts. Thank you for coming this evening. Next is Ashley Holdsworth. Good evening, President Pingarelli and members of the board. My name is Ashley Holdsworth, and I am the seventh grade math teacher at Desert Valley Elementary School. Blended and personalized learning, when utilized appropriately, promotes student success in several ways. I want to take a moment to share with you what technology and personalized learning in my classroom means to the success of my students. My classroom is broken into three stations. One station is with me. At this station, I model mathematics and the students take note and practice with my supervision. At another station, the students practice mathematics independently or with a peer group. At the last station, students are on laptops using the iReady program to help fill in academic gaps and challenge the students who have already mastered seventh grade standards. My seventh grade students are more engaged and I have fewer discipline issues as a result. It's great to see the students moving around and take responsibility for their learning. Please let me stress this. I have seen powerful growth since switching to a blended learning model. Using SchoolNet to track my data, I have seen the following results. On the first IU test that covers integers, the district average was a 64%. My student's average was an 81%. On the second IU test that covers rational numbers, the district average was a 50%. My student's average was a 72%. My students have averaged two letter grades higher than the district. 
You may want to claim that I'm an experienced teacher and that is why my students do well. Well, I am not. This is my second year teaching. You may want to claim that my students come from an affluent neighborhood. As I stated earlier, I teach at Desert Valley, which is a Southern Title I school. Yes, each group of students we teach is different, and I know I teach a wonderful group at DV. But I also know that when utilized appropriately, alongside teaching and not in place of it, blended and personalized learning can be a beautiful thing. My students love that I get to teach nine of them at a time. They feel like they're being heard. And so I'm asking that you hear me right now. Do not roll back technology and personalized learning just because people don't know how to use it. Instead, train them. Do not roll back technology and personalized learning because we feel we can't afford it. As a teacher in the trenches every day working with these students, I'd like to tell you we can't afford not to continue to use these programs. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. Um, Trina Berg. Good evening, President Pangarelli, members of the board. Um, last year, our board voted on, I believe, a three to two vote to not go out for a bond. And it was a much needed bond, and I feel like we all know and realize that it's a much needed bond. And then when election night came and went this week, we watched every single Maricopa County school pass their bonds and overrides. And I feel, for one, that this board squandered an opportunity that we could have followed suit with all the rest of the districts around us and passed our bond. And instead, it feels like it was a very political move by our board to not pursue the bond at that time so that we could get support by a group that has very traditionally not supported education in the public schools, in the district public schools, I should say. Um, but instead, wait until their election year so that they can actually say, we supported a district public school bond. And I feel like we were, um, we, we lost. We lost an opportunity that was huge in this last election cycle. And I know it would have been fast, and I know we would have had to work hard and very quickly to get that done, but I feel like we squandered that opportunity. It's very disappointing. Um, on another side note, I feel like there has been, all of a sudden this week, your staff, your teachers, your administrators, your classified, your entire employment here, we've been a little blindsided by events that we don't know anything about yet. And you've created a lot of uncertainty with your, employ with your staff. Um, teachers this year have felt different. We've seen a different direction this district has moved. And for the most part, your teachers are enjoying this year. Personalized learning is something that needs to take time, and we have a different direction, a direction that I haven't seen in 17 years in this district. Um, and now we just have a bunch of uncertainty, and we don't know what's happening. And I know that you can't, you've had executive sessions, and I know you can't say anything, but there's rumors, and there's lots of rumors. And uncertainty breeds issues. You're trying to retain teachers, and right now you've got a lot of scared teachers, and we don't know what's happening. I really hope that things get resolved very quickly. You have teachers that this year, for the first time in a very long time, were enjoying teaching again. Your morale has been higher this year overall in this district than it has been in a very long time. And I'm concerned that we're going to roll back and fall back. And it feels, from an outsider person looking in, it feels very political. And I think we need to um, take a step back and really find out what your staff are feeling and what they're wanting in this situation. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next speaker is Bob uh, Gazula. President Pincarelli and board members. I'm Bob Gonzalo. I was a counselor at Peoria High School for 33 years. Um, I'm going to talk about the MET program uh, and Peoria High School. 2014-2013, um, I was part of a, a committee of about 15 people that came to the board and we were on the board to try to solve the problem of um, redoing Old Main. We did the redo Old Main. Uh, Denton Santarelli said, we're going to put the MET program in there. They put the thousands of dollars in there to rewire the building and move the MET program in there, along with an alternative school. Now, all of a sudden, we're going to move that MET program 
up to Challenger Center, I assume. At least that's the word on the street. Um, let me tell you something that's wrong. Any educator in their right mind would tell you that Peoria High School should never have an alternative school. Never. And I'm going to tell you why. That is the lowest functioning school, the neediest school in the district, the ones that need the role models more than anything else. And if you put in alternative schools, that's a volatile group. And to put a volatile group on a need-based campus is the worst thing you could possibly do. And whoever came up with that idea of putting alternative schools at Peoria High School is not a good educator. I can tell you that right now. And I don't know who came up with that idea. The MET program was promised by Denton Centerelli that it would be on that campus. And it's a great thing for the kids of that campus as role models and engineering programs and things like that for minority students. I was there for a lot of time. And all the time that I was at Peoria High School, um, we had to work to overcome a lot of things at Peoria. One was the image, okay, because it didn't matter what happened. Somebody would come up with a thing, hey, uh, I'm not sending my kid to Peoria High School because you're going to get stabbed in the bathroom. I can tell you in 33 years that I was there, I never saw a gun. I never saw anybody get stabbed. But that came all the time. And now, when you put a program like the MET program in a campus that's a minority campus, and it's, I don't know if it's functioning or not, but it should stay there, and you should get every alternative kid off that campus, because it does that campus no good at all. And I will tell you right now, you know, in the newspaper it was talking about rich schools, poor schools. Rich schools get more money than poor schools because of their grades or whatever it is. It's the same thing in this district. It's the same thing in the city of Glendale. It's the same thing in the city of Peoria. If you look at it, the northern areas of the city get more things than the southern areas. You need to change that trend. We need to build more programs down there. There's five high schools down in the south. There's, what, two in the north? Tell me, where should the facilities be? We should promote the, the things that are happening in the south. I think you're completely wrong in moving the uh, MET program up north. And I mean, I mean, it might be a great building or whatever. I don't think of buildings. I think of kids. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Gilbert Romero. Good evening, uh, President Pingarelli, members of the board. My name is Gilbert Romero. Uh, I'm a community organizer, an activist, and a K-12 Peoria Unified School District product. Today is a very special day in our community, in my community specifically. Today, thousands of young immigrants have gathered in Washington, D.C., demanding our Congress to pass a Clean Dream Act in place of the program DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, that President Trump unfortunately took away. Growing up in the school district, I knew many undocumented students in our, in our district. They were my friends, they were my neighbors, and this is a time of much fear and uncertainty for the undocumented youth. It is the job of a school district to ensure that our students have a safe place to learn. Now studies show that being undocumented and in fear of deportation has psychological consequences for young immigrants. It causes trauma, it causes anxiety disorders, and depression disorders. Right now, nearly a million students in our country are at risk for deportation. If Congress does not pass the Clean Dream Act by the end of December, nearly a million undocumented students will be at risk for deportation, and families and communities will be torn apart. Families and communities in our district will be torn apart. I've already had one friend deported, and he left a wife and kids. And I don't want to see that happen in our school district. So the governing board has the power and the privilege to do something about it, to ensure that our, that our students who are undocumented, whether they're DACA recipients or not, feel safe in our district. So I'm requesting a couple things that you can do in your power today, right now, before March 5th of 2018, when, when nearly a million undocumented students will be at risk for deportation. These are tangible things that you can do right now that other school districts in the country have done and are currently doing in Arizona. First, pass a unanimous, unequivocal resolution that this school district, that this governing board supports undocumented students and DACA recipients, that you support them, that you'll create a safe space for them, and that, and number two, um, require that the SROs, school resource officers, do not collaborate with Immigration Customs Enforcement. That, if I'm correct, if I'm not uh, mistaken, SROs are hired by the district, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so ensure that the SROs do not collaborate with ICE because it is neither 
their job to act as immigration agents. It's both not only illegal, but unethical and cruel to, to interact with immigration customs enforcement if we get, if we get to that point. Um, again, March 5th is when students in our district will be at risk for deportation if our Congress does not do anything with the nearly one million undocumented students in our country who have DACA. So I hope that you all consider passing a resolution supporting our undocumented students because they are here in our district. You, you may not know anybody, you may not know them by name, but they are here, I guarantee you. Um, if you all have more questions, if you all need guidance on this, I'm more than willing to be of assistance because this is an urgent matter. Um, again, by March 5th of next year, students in our district will be at risk for deportations and I do not want to see our community, I don't want to see families torn apart by a cruel and inhumane administration. So thank you so much for your time and yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, that is all the speakers on this topic. Let's move on to next area is the consent agenda. Um, does any board member want to pull anything from the consent agenda this evening? Mrs. Pingarelli had a question about 5.12. Oh, uh, did you want to pull or just? Okay. Then can we pull 5.12? It'll just take a minute while uh, she adjusts the schedule. Um, then I would need a motion and a second to... I move, I'll move to approve the consent agenda with the exception of 5.12. I'll right. second. Uh, members, please cast your vote. might take us a little more time this evening. It's a second board member or board meeting with uh, board docs. All right, it passes 5-0. So my question is this. Um, it's an affiliation agreement with Western Michigan University in which their interns will be interacting with our students. And I, the, the uh, attorney's recommendation after they looked over it was that we made sure that we selected a supervisor that would, would supervise those interns. And I just want to make sure that that was established uh, President Pangarelli members of the board yes we have established that it's a typical agreement that we've entered into and it's our current occupational therapist and physical therapist that would be the uh, coordinator of that program okay. provide the supervision thank you very much I move to approve item 5.12 I'll second that. Members, please cast your vote. All right, passes 5-0. Next item, uh, addressed, uh, excuse me, number six, address agenda and consider adoption or recommended changes. Um, does any governing board member need a change to the agenda this evening? Mrs. Pingarelli, yes. I suggest that we take item 7.2 and move it to below 7.4. 
I have no problem with that. Does anybody else have an issue with that? No? Okay. Do you need a second? Yeah, I have a I second. All right, that passes 5-0. So let's move on to agenda item 7.1. Consideration of recommendation for administrative uh, appointment for assistant principal for, uh, for attendance and discipline at Liberty High School. Uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Davidson, welcome. Uh, thank you, President Pingarelli, members of the board. Tonight I come to you with a request for action, please, and that would be that um, you consider uh, recommending, and we recommend that you consider taking a vote on approving the administrative appointment of Ms. Katie Redipper to serve as the assistant principal for attendance and discipline at Liberty High School. And I would uh, love if you wouldn't mind uh, voting on that, please, prior to me reading her biography and uh, introducing her. That would be great. Thank uh, you. Then I would need a motion and a second. Mrs. Pingarelli, I move to approve Mrs. Redipper um, for the position at Liberty High School. Second. All right, members, please cast your vote. All right, that passes 5-0. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> uh, this is a very exciting time uh, for a, a new administrator to our team. So I'm going to read uh, Ms. Ridiper's uh, biography and then invite her up for any questions that you may have for her. Okay, uh, Ms. Ridiper, uh, we're recommending her to be appointed to the position of assistant principal for attendance and discipline at Liberty High School. Ms. Ridiper will be replacing Barb Coakley, who recently moved to the Met Professional Academy as director for that program. Mrs. Ridiper spent the last 12 years teaching mathematics and teen leadership at Raymond S. Kellis High School. She has served as the instructional lead since 2014, and during her tenure led the school-wide implementation of Capturing Kids' Heart. Mrs. Ridiper has attended Peoria's Aspiring Administrator Leadership Academy and holds a Bachelor's of Secondary Education in Mathematics from Arizona State University and a Master's of Education in Administrative Supervision from Grand Canyon University. So thank you for your affirmative vote tonight. And Mrs. Ridiper, would you like to come to the mic? Congratulations. You can. <laughs> so the question is, can she introduce her family and guests? And I will well, certainly allow her to do that. She stole my thunder, but I'll let her do that. No, I'm just playing. Go on. Enjoy. President Pangarelli, members of the board, it is an honor and a privilege to be here standing before you today. Um, I am looking so forward to this opportunity at Liberty High School. I have loved my 11 and a half years at Kellis. It has been my home, let's be real. I've been there more hours in the day than I've been at my own house. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited to kind of spread my wings, expand my influence at Liberty High School. And I have brought, um, my mother is here, my husband, my two children. Um, my husband is a teacher in the district as well. My two children, Emma and Colin, they're the ones kind of causing a ruckus, so I apologize <laughs> for that. Um, I have my wonderful in-laws, uh, Deb Ritiper, who's a retired teacher from our district, uh, my father-in-law, Steve, and I actually brought my third grade teacher is here because she was my inspiration to be an educator um, and has been at every life event for me. So this was not one I could have her pass up. So I have um, an amazing support system. I also have teachers and friends who are here. Um, Jeff Wooten, my current administrator, I think he's sneaking and hiding in the back. Um, he jokingly 
said to me that if this were a wedding, he would stand up in front of everyone and say, um, yes, this is not allowed. I, I, do, not, <laughs> I do not consent to this, but uh, he's been, been behaving himself back there, so I appreciate that. But I am really looking forward uh, to this opportunity at Liberty High School, and I will stand for any questions you have for me. All right. Uh, Mr. Sandoval, you want to start first? Sure. No, absolutely. Uh, first off, congratulations. Thank you. Yep. And, uh, and thank you. Um, you, you mentioned expanding your horizons, and, and that was kind of in my head when uh, Dr. Davidson was talking about uh, your leadership skills. Um, you know, so you know, again, you know, as you continue along the path of you know educating and mentoring and uh, inspiring, you know, our youth, um, you know, it's uh, I just want to extend my gratitude uh, to your willingness to um, you know expand on your horizons and. Uh, you know, really, and share your leadership, you know, across the different uh, sites and uh, throughout our district. So thank you, and congratulations. Thank you. Mrs. Doan? Yes, congratulations. It's wonderful to see um, such dedication and, and the time and effort that you have spent getting where you are. I know it's been a lot. Um, thank you for your um, dedication to our effort with these children that, that need everything we can give them. Thank you so much, and congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Connect. We know you thrived at Kellis, and you will thrive at Liberty. So how long is the commute now? Um, I'm going from a 25-minute commute to about a 10. Oh, very good. Yeah. Very good. So just a like, bonus. That's it excellent. is. It's a bonus. It just means more evenings spent at home with the family and also bringing them back to Liberty events in my mind. So okay. I think that's good. Well, tra trading one cat for another. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Going from a cougar to a lion. Yeah, that's right. It's a definite change in the wardrobe, though. I've been, uh, yeah, I've been yeah. a blue and gold for quite some time. Okay. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Did you say Hermitinas? Awesome. Congratulations. At your, since your drive is 10 minutes, I'm assuming you'll probably run into some of your students as well in that area. <laughs> For sure. And I actually look forward to that. That's yeah. something that I think is amazing because you're building the community. Definitely awesome. I do have a question because I've been hearing a lot about the Peoria aspiring administrator leadership. How do you, uh, what, if you can think of one thing that you took away that you're going to apply at Liberty, what stands out? I think something that really stood out to me was um, when Allie Bridgewater came and spoke to our team last year. She talked about um, you have a team of support and decision makers who are always there to have your back and don't think you ever have to do anything alone. So that really stood out to me that you can always reach out and make sure that you don't know what you don't know until you find out. And it's always really good to have that support system in place to know that you can reach out to people and they're not going to judge you for it. They want that. They're there to support you. That's a great takeaway. Thank you so much, and good luck. Thank you. Yes, again, congratulations. Uh, um, it, it's, uh, it's a great move, I'm sure, for you. And uh, I'm uh, glad your family was able to come this evening. I know that Mr. Wooten is probably very sad this evening, <laughs> but uh, he'll get over it. <laughs> well, congratulations, and thank you for coming. Thank and, you. Uh, if, uh, if you guys would, if, I know you probably don't want to stick around, so don't feel like you have to stick around if, you know, make your husband take uh, everybody out to dinner. Okay. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming, and congratulations. Thank you again. <clears throat> thank you. big entourage. I thought they were here for us this evening. All right. Next agenda item. Discussion, consideration, and possible action on bylaw change proposals from the Arizona School Boards Association. And who is doing that this evening? Did you want me to do this? 
Do you, if you would like to, that would be great. I'm happy to do that. Um, I've seen this document discussed multiple times over over the month of October at the county meeting, so I, I know the drill. Um, so as you know, um, ASBA is a member-driven organization, and it is the membership um, that each member is a school district as a whole, and that it is the membership that decides both the political agenda but also these bylaws. Um, and right now, uh, it takes 66% of all the member districts to vote in the affirmative to amend or repeal a law, a bylaw, and the um, and the voting is done electronically. So um, the decisions that we make today, we will uh, direct. I'm assuming Diane to um, submit um, our decisions on our behalf. So we can go through them. Do you prefer, Madam President, that we go through them one by one? Oh, that probably uh, be best. Yes. Okay. So the first, oh, and by the way, um, these proposals uh, can be submitted by individual boards. I think we submitted one last year and it didn't get picked up by the, by the committee, um, or by standing committees. Uh, and then they get for, forwarded through the legislative, the delegate assembly, which Mrs. Martinez um, sat through. No, I'm sorry, I'm getting that confused with the legislative, um, but goes through the, um, the bylaw committee and, and then we have to vote on them. So proposal A, um, it would be that if there there is a director or an officer, in other words, a seated board member on the ASBA board of directors, if he or she misses more than one meeting in a calendar year, he or she will be deemed that they have vacated their office. And the, the thinking behind that is there are only four meetings in a year um, one meeting, in, regardless of the reason, your uh, board member is allowed to meet one meeting, but if he or she meets a second meeting, um, if, if this bylaw would pass, that position would be appointed or refilled by an election. Okay. Um, discussion from board members? Uh, Mrs. Doan? Uh, Mrs. Sehar Martinez? No. Okay. Um, it's, there are so few meetings, I would recommend that we pass this. Okay. I move to, um, to vote, a, vote I on Proposal A. I'll second, second. that. All right. Uh, members, please cast your vote. Is it? Should we do them one by one? We have or to, they, some it? of them are contradictory. Yes. Yeah. So let's just let, we'll just keep track, and then at the end we'll we'll give you a list. How's that? All right. Okay. All right. Proposal B, ASBA Governance Committee, that came from our Standing Committee, proposes that a quorum of 60 percent of the ASBA board mem uh, member boards must vote and three-fourths of all votes must be in the affirmative to add, amend, or repeal a bylaw. What that does, in effect, is it lowers the threshold by five by six percent. And the thinking behind that is it has been very difficult to get to that 66 percent threshold. And um, what that does is it ties the hands of the association from making any changes. Now, I think um, we have to take C in, in consideration at the same time because we can vote no on both. We can vote yes on one, but we cannot vote yes on both because they do contradict, um, like Mrs. Doan said. So proposal C is uh, came from Maricopa uh, Unified. They recommend that a bylaw may be amended or repealed by an affirmative vote of two thirds of the ASBA member boards that vote. So there's no threshold about the number of school boards that can participate. It can be very, very low, and then two thirds of them. And for me, I'll start with my commentary. That means that the direction of the association can be changed by a very few number of boards if we have um, 
if we have low turnout in one year. So that the proposal C does not appeal to me. Mrs. Knack, do you have the information on what is the usual uh, participation? We received that at one of the county meetings, but I don't have it. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, I know we have not met that threshold yet, and si but since the electronic voting has started, we have gotten closer to it. Okay, thank you. It has improved over the last three years. So in my opinion, proposal B gets us closer. I'd be, will I'd be willing to support proposal B because I still think it maintains a high threshold, but it's not as high as it has been. Might be able to move something. Might be able to move something. Mrs. Pengarelli, mm -hmm. thank you for the commentary, um, governing board members. I have always stated the more voices to get the most opinion from all sides. I would agree with you, uh, Mrs. Connect, that proposal B. I did watch the YouTube videos sent out by AISBA and all these um, issues that we're proposing, and I would agree that proposal B would get the most voices to the table. I agree with that also. Okay, then I will move to approve proposal B and vote no on proposal C. I second. Oh wait, we're doing that all at the end. Yeah. Well, we we, we just keep a yeah, consensus. Yeah. Yeah. We're all in agreement so far. Okay, so A is a yes, and B is a yes, and C is a no so far. Okay, proposal D comes from Tempe Elementary, um, and they are proposing uh, just to change the name of the Hispanic Native American Indian Caucus to the Hispanic Native American Caucus, and that is apparent. Uh, that is the the term that the members of that caucus would prefer. So, Mrs. Pengarelli, yes, I can speak on this. When I did attend uh, the caucus meeting, when both of them were together, at this time, as the caucus stands, both uh, ethnic ethnicities represent one caucus and they have selected this name in a vote uh, so this is what was proposed so we can agree on that I have no problem with so that. Okay. yes um, item D Gila Bend Unified proposed an amendment that will allow a seat on the ASBA Board of Directors for the president and past president of the Hispanic Native now maybe Indian caucus um, Native American caucus um, and the thinking well the background as you can see is uh, right now the president of that caucus has one seat on the board and that rotates from or alternates from year to year so that one year that representative is Hispanic and the next year it's a Native American um, so just what, what you need to know is that this would increase the membership on the board by one individual, which does have a financial cost to the association. I would say, however, that Hispanic and Native American issues are widely different in many occasions. So... I, I don't disagree with that, but they have decided to unify as one caucus, and they did that several years ago. So, so is, it would be the role of the caucus's president, um, whether at the time it's Hispanic or Native American, to represent the greater good uh, of the caucus, both ethnic groups. That would be the ideal situation. But how... Um how is the caucus divi divided as far as membership goes? Is it fairly even, or mm, the Ms. voting members are the voting members going to be more Hispanic or more Native American? Mrs. Pangarelli, mm -hmm. that's a great question, Mrs. Doan. Uh, so, as I've been able to attend uh, a lot of the, or more so, these conferences, um, the one vote dilutes the separation of representing the Hispanic. And the Native American, to your point, Mrs. Doan, they are totally separate. And to your point, Mrs. Connect, that may have been 
the issue a few years back that they wanted one caucus, but the reality is I have an opportunity to speak to them to the point they wanted two separate caucuses for both representing D D each issue to the point where the Arizona Latino School Board Association pulled away from the Arizona S School Board Association to have their own representation. So the fact that we minimize their vote to one to combine them concerns me. Oh, me too. Almost to the point where I wa re watched this same proposal came one year ago and you had the same argument. So I wanted to see why would you want to minimize uh, an ethnicity because they have the same viewpoint. So I wanted to get your, your perspective of why having one vote. Did you just say that I wanted to minimize the perspective of an ethnicity? Well, you stated that they already have a vote at the seat. So I was just trying to understand. So I apologize for misstating that. I just rewatched the. A year ago, you said you wanted one vote for one ethnicity, when the reality is there's two separate ethnicities with two different backgrounds. It's one caucus, and I think it's appropriate for one caucus to have one seat at the table. I don't feel like the ASBA Board of Directors is underrepresented for either ethnicity. Um, we have Native American and Latino board members who do not represent uh, the caucus, but they represent the, their county or their community. And I look at it as, as Arizona shifts to a more Latino population where we're not becoming the minority, we should have not the minority on the directors of Arizona School Boards Association, and it should reflect the community and the students they serve. So with this proposal, I do support two separate. Well, I, my vote, or my mind hasn't been um, changed from last year. I voted yes on, on this one last year, and um, that's how I would proceed today. So it looks like this is the only one that so far we're not um, in complete agreement on. So I mean, it, it, I'm not sure at this point, do we have the opportunity to influence, um, you know, the, the two caucuses uh, that are represented by uh, the Hispanic community and, and one represented by the Native American Indian or Native American community? C certainly, the members of that caucus, and I am a member of that caucus, yeah. um, have the ability to, to, uh, to formulate the way that they want to move forward. But for me, right, you know, for me, because of, because I believe that we have good representation. Remember that members of the board are represented, are, are members of their own board that whose whose community have represented them, and then their county represents from the boards in the county. So I think it is a multi-level representative group. Once my, my uh, background in nonprofit development or nonprofit management, once you get over 12 or 15 members of a board, it gets a little more difficult to, um, to, um, to govern. And so I've, I really feel like this has been working in my experience over the last few years. And for, for those reasons, I don't see the need to add a member to the board. But we can take a vote on it. I think we probably should. This is probably the only one right so far that we're, um, um, we're kind of split on. So, Diane, should we vote on this one? So move a, a motion in a second and see if it passes? Or, no, or just wait. We'll take a vote on it so we know what to report. OK. Just a voice vote? OK. Um, I move to to support two seats, one for the Hispanic uh, president and one for the past president for Native American. And I'll second that this evening. Um, then all in favor, um, say aye. 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 Looks like it's three. Um, all opposed? No. But we'll put that down as a yes. Okay, item F comes from Concho Elementary, and they propose that no action by any delegate or presiding authority shall end debate or discussion at the delegate assembly. No. Now this one, Monica, you might be able to speak to because you were there. The practice is now that after the debate about an issue at the delegate assembly, has gone on for some period of time, and maybe some of the participants are repeating each other, and the issue seems to have been thoroughly discussed, often what happens is a, a member of the delegate assembly will stand up and make a motion to end the debate. 
Now that motion needs two thirds to pass. So it's not like somebody can just get up and snap their fingers and, and it's, it's over. But this would say that nobody would be allowed to do that and that the conversation would have to take its course until everybody had exhausted everything that they wanted to say. That could uh, be a long evening. And, and I, feel com I feel comfortable with the fact that two-thirds of the, of the body needs to approve if the debate is to end. I feel, I feel like that is a good safeguard. I think we can agree probably that we don't want this one. <laughs> I would agree with you also, Mrs. Connect. I would agree. As it follows Robert's rules, too. Okay. Okay, item G, Concho ESD proposes an amendment to establish a conservative caucus to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Um, from the uh, existing bylaws, ASBA caucuses shall exist to enhance the work of the association by addressing the unique needs of member districts. Caucuses are considered to be affiliated as a program provider with the responsibility for the caucuses. Each caucus is expected to adopt its own bylaws for operating, programming, and governing within the context of the relationship with ASBA described herein. Mrs. Pangarelli, with this one I have a concern with the word conservative, very subjective. So I would, I would, I would say no. My thinking is exactly related to the other caucus. Um, one, the size of a caucus. Two is the expense of adding a board member because this would be a board member. Three is because we, every board member in the state uh, already um, takes an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States, so it seems a little bit redundant to me. Um, and there again, every board member, every member of the board has already been through two levels of approval from his or her community. So I don't know that adding another caucus is necessary. I would vote no on this one also. Mrs. No. Stone? I'm in agreement with you. Okay, so that one's a no. Okay, that's G. And finally, is this finally? Yes, Littleton Elementary proposed a recommendation that the legislative committee uh, shall hold a delegate assembly workshop in advance of the delegate assembly to orient new or existing members uh, before that meeting. Um, and the background is operational matters related to the delegate assembly are currently not included in the bylaws. And I think that's critical. In the past, um, the staff members of ASBA have held a workshop prior to the delegate assembly, um, but they were poorly attended. I mean, in different years they were some, some were better than other, but in general they were poorly attended. Um, and I think any, any board, any iteration of the board moving forward or any iteration of the staff moving forward can decide if they want to put on a workshop, uh, an orientation workshop. But I don't know that this needs to be something that needs to be codified in a bylaw. Because once it is, it's mandated that they must. And to your other point of cost, if we mandate and we're looking at cost and we have the same, uh, to be cognizant of that. I would agree with you. I would agree also. Great. Me too. Okay. Okay, so, Ms. Savage, I move that we submit the following votes on the ASB bylaw, ASBA bylaw proposals. Yes for A, yes for B, no for C, yes for D, yes for E, no for F, no for G, and yes for H. I thought that was a no for That H. was a no for H. Oh, sorry. No for H. Thank you. All right. I second. All right, members, please cast your vote on all of those. And Mrs. Connect, thank you very much for going through those. You're welcome.
All right, passes 5-0. Next agenda item. Okay, second reading discussion and possible action pertaining to uh, proposed governing board policy HA meet and confer. Uh, Dr. Davidson, welcome. Back. Hi, President Pingarelli, members of the board. I'm uh, serving tonight as a district administration uh, representation um, to hear from you and receive guidance regarding uh, the proposed second reading of policy HA. And I believe there was a regulation that is, you've also been reviewing. Um, I simply stand here to support the conversation and take any advice and guidance that you have regarding that policy. Okay. Um, Mrs. Sejar Martinez, would you like to start us? Sure. Uh, thank you again for the, bringing this back up for a second read. Based on um, information received via legal, there has been uh, the new proposal that's sitting in front of uh, all of you. The superintendent shall establish procedures to meet and confer with staff regarding compensation and benefits. Uh, the information was provided uh, includes all seats at the table with representation of administration, certified and classified. And we have been moving in this direction for quite some time. So I am glad to see that this is up for uh, conversation again. And I understand clearly that this is not a committee of the board. It is the committee of the superintendent. And it's the responsibility of the governing board to hold the superintendent to execute this request by the governing board. Um, as we stated, Mrs. Connect said at once, since in policy, it's mandated. So it is definitely a direction that we are heading in. Um, the governing board has always said, teachers come first. And in that statement, I would like to add teachers, admin, and classified. And this is a great way to go that way. Right, and uh, my apologies, um, um, Trina Berg, I should have asked you first to, to start us off. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening, President Pangrelli, members of the board. My name is Trina Berg. I'm president of the Peoria Education Association, and it is no secret that we have been pushing for this for a very long time. However, I had issues with the language of draft one. I have even more issues with language of draft two, and now with the uncertainty of our superintendent. I'm actually going to ask that we table this for right now until we have a little bit more stability in our district. Thank you. There's no more speakers. Um, Mrs. Connect, do you want to have any discussions? So um, what are you saying, Mrs. Martinez, about what were you saying about the, the specific groups? That we are headed in the right direction. Mr. Sandoval stated in the previous uh, governing board that it is a starting point that eventually we could add to it. At this point, this would put something in policy that we continue that conversation and we have an opportunity to hold the superintendent accountable of inviting staff and we would ha request as, his, as the governing board to include certified, classified, and admin. Well, you're, you, kind, you kind of touched on where I was headed with this. Um, uh, it, it's an improvement on what we had before. I will agree with that. Um, but I'm not, I don't think it's complete enough. Um, I, I do agree that I'm really not comfortable assigning um, any new responsibilities, especially one that is as important as this one is, uh, to the position of superintendent at this time. Um, and, it, and the other thing is it, it really when we were at the retreat and we were talking and there were representatives from associations in the room, um, I thought we had, were coming to consensus that we would craft a document that would, would name the groups that we wanted to ensure had a seat at a table. The PEA, CTA, unaffiliated teachers, PPA, um, and, and we've, we've pulled back from that. And I, I, I really liked that vision, and I'm disappointed that, that we haven't done that. I know that we've heard, we've heard commentary that you know, that's maybe not a good idea, but if this is a tool that we're using um, to ensure that all groups have a, have a seat at the table and wanting to um, show our goodwill to our employee groups, I don't know why we wouldn't put it in writing. So I don't think that this meets our needs. Uh, Mrs. Doan. Well, looking at the um, HA meet and confer, 
the HA dash R. It's that's not what we would be um, establishing, but that's a guidance. And it's looking pretty good. Um, it is a way to get everyone involved <coughs> and to meet with uh, our superintendent and, and, and for all voices to be heard. And of course, the changes as uh, recommended by our attorney. So. I think it's a place we can start with if we want to get something going now. Um, it is not complete, but it's a springboard. Um, so I, I wouldn't have any trouble starting here uh, if, if we decide that. Uh, Mr. Sandoval? I would agree. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's, pretty light uh, with regard to uh, um, details uh, without question. Um, I, I guess I always kind of start with the outcome that we're wanting to realize with regard you know, to this um, policy. And when I take a look at the HA meet and confer, um, our ultimate goal is to realize, we've talked about MOU's per professional agreement, however we want to title it, right? And for me, when I take a look at how the HA meet and confer reads, it's almost as if that is, is the job of the district anyway, um, to meet and confer, to make sure that every voice of the district is heard. I, I don't understand um, you know, why um, that would need to be a policy. I mean, for me, this is more of a process within an MOU, or to inform an MOU, or to inform a professional agreement. Um, but I certainly don't see this as a uh, as something that um, gives me the peace of mind that um, you know it's it's inclusive, um, you know, across the district. I, I do agree when you take a look at HAR. You know, it does talk about classified staff administration, but I, I do believe um, you know, when we take a look at um, uh, PEA, uh, CTA, and some of the other organizations that uh, Ms. Connect spoke to. Um, I, I do believe that um, you know it needs to be very specific to ensure that those individuals, those organizations, have a, a seat at the table. I mean, their role across the district is to represent, to be the voice of those individuals um, that they serve on a daily basis. Um, so I'm going to concur um, with uh, um, what I've heard earlier that uh, I think this this truly needs to have a little more meat. Um, I agree, it, it's a good starting point with regard to the major categories of comp compensation and benefits. I've always stated it's something that needs to be living and working and continue to evolve as we evolve as a district, as we you know, have our you know, interest-based negotiations. If you know, that is a process in informing this, 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 uh, this policy. Um, but uh, right now, it, just, uh, it, uh, it, it, it doesn't have enough um, legs to it. Uh, to to really uphold what's what it's meant to be, uh, you know, I, I I think it could work both ways. You know, it benefits the district, it benefits its associates, um, but uh, I definitely think it needs uh, some some more work. And, and Dr. Davidson, I know that's kind of a an overarching, very broad, maybe even vague statement. You know, what does that mean, right? A lot of work, but I think it, it truly. Uh, does need to uh, be very specific, you know, on making sure that each one of those groups has a position, a seat at the table, um, and um, you know, and, and I, I think it needs to um, truly, you know, define um, everything that we believe in that, and that we say as a district on a daily basis. You know, that we respect and value um, our teachers and staff, and that uh, you know their voice um, not only weighted but is, is certainly one that. Um, you know, makes us smarter and one that's valued that we need, we need to make sure that's heard. Thank you. Mrs. Pangarelli, mm -hmm. um, you did bring up a good point. Mrs. Doan was time sensitive. Dr. Uh, Davidson, I know one of the reasons why we brought this up is because we wanted to get it out before contract and per uh, a comment uh, from Mrs. Berg, PEA, that if we delay this, when is our district looking at renewing those contracts and how will that impact if we don't go in and make a decision now? Are we looking at next year, next contract? 
as it relates to um, the way the contract language would be established or even the way in which our committee would um, look at um, compensation, I don't believe any delay here would uh, impede the process. I believe Mr. Hicks and the Budget Committee, as you will give guidance as well, will incorporate all of our stakeholders to have the conversation that's necessary to um, do what's right on behalf of our employees. So um, right. I hope that answers your question. I, I, I guess in a nutshell, our hope would be that we can continue to bring our contracts out um, as we did last year earlier than in years past um, to allow us to be competitive in, in, our, in the marketplace. Perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. I wanted to make sure that if we decided to delay this per the request of teachers and administrators and staff, that it wasn't going to impede on us getting our district getting out those contracts sooner than later uh, so we can have teachers in the classrooms. I have seen nothing but, um, uh, uh, and I guess, uh, some positivity as it relates to bringing stakeholders to the table to deal with important issues. And it sounds like you support that. And I don't believe we would give you anything less but, uh, but that. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and the only other question or comment, um, David, you, you had mentioned PEA, and we've heard parents say that we don't want our school district to be political. But from my understanding, MOU and PEA and CTA, those organizations, do they tend to be political? Do you mind elaborating as we've heard strong and clear we don't want our district to be political but be essentially nonpartisan? So, I mean, I can just say I'm not aware of those organizations being politically driven. Okay. I appreciate that. Well, I know we've been working on this, um, or it's been in the process for quite a while. Uh, we had an executive session uh, with our attorney um, to go through the language, and um, uh, I agree with the changes. Um, I have no issue with this. I think it's important that everybody uh, have a seat at the table. Um, so um, I'm, I'm fine with this as it stands now, uh, but uh, um, it seems like there's a <clears throat> little difference of opinion uh, right now. So um, if the, the board would like to move forward, uh, I would need a motion. If the board would like to table, I would need a motion. I'm still, and I apologize, I'm still a little, there's gray area because there's three things we're looking at. We're, we're looking at HA, we're looking at HAR, we're looking at an MOU. So well, um, this would be just, is, is this, this is just HA. This is just a read today. And this, no, we can vote on this if we want to. If we. My understanding is at least the way I believe it reads, Diane, that this is a second reading of policy HA. And possible action, it says. Yes, ma'am. Or it can be pushed. I definitely want all, all all sections to be represented. Well, can we um, ask our attorney if that's the way, if we could just add in there the three sections that, you know, our admin, our classified, and our certified would each have the same number of people in the group, or I don't know if that's advisable. I, we'd need to run it past our attorney. Well, I think that... And would that that would be up to us. Um, I'm just wondering if we want to do that. We can. From my understanding, and Mrs. Connect, when we received legal information, the proposals were to help mitigate risk to the district. Is that correct? Anybody? That's right. That's what the attorney said. So I. Honestly, I'm at a loss. Other than there are three proposals, I would like to have more uh, representation. And we've heard from a, a teacher. Do we have any administrators who would like to give their input? All right. <laughs> Mr. Hicks. Um, Madam President, members of the board, um, I, my only input is, is that um, delaying it, we have not started our budget team. Uh, so if you remember last year when we made our recommendations, the recommendations was to start earlier. We haven't even adopted the budget process, which we approved, I believe, last year, last September. So we're about two months behind, and we asked to start earlier. So if delaying it means to come back to continue to work on it, um, that would create a lot more problems with, because the regulation here is proposing a new type of budget team or an election in that sense, where right now we have representation of all groups, but they're not elected. Um, they were elected by each group, but not by totally by all. 
So they were nominated or just given uh, whoever were willing. So if the thought is delay it and let's work on it for implementation for the following budget process, then that would not have an impact on the budget process. I thought that was what Dr. Davidson said, that in, in the absence of a new procedure, we utilize the former procedure. Is that correct, Dr. Davidson? That was my understanding. But we have had no approval to do that. So everything's on hold right now. And tabling it would be, how are we tabling it? Are we tabling it to continue to work on it or to wait until next year? Do we need to approve the procedure every year or is it just assumed that unless there are changes, we move forward? Uh, we have traditionally here, uh, Madam President, members of the board, we have traditionally here the last three years brought it to the board just for transparency of how we're handling the budget process. But well, there's, uh, there's no policy requirement that we approve the entire process by the governing board. Well, I'll move to table this um, until a further time when it is more appropriate to bring it forward with the assumption that we go back to the, the, the procedure that's in okay. place. As long as I spell it. Second. <clears throat> I didn't want just a clean table. Thank you. Um, just a question before we vote. Now, if we do it that way, it doesn't impact our um, district, right? Madam President, members wait. of the board, with that final qualification that clears it up to make sure that we, yes, we can continue the current budget process as we continue to work on the other. Perfect. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, no. All right, we have a motion and a second. When Diane is ready, um, members, please cast your vote on this one. Motion is to table, correct? Yes, I do. That's not what it says on our screen. Oh. Oops. Better change my vote. And just to clarify for the board, that can be brought back at any time on the request of two board members. Well, thank you for your patience. It'll take uh, just another minute. I will express my disappointment that we weren't able to solidify a more comprehensive document. It has been taken quite a while. Here we go. Pardon? I think it'll be... It'll, it'll go. Right. All right, passes 5 0. And thank you very much. Uh, next agenda item. is item 7.4, presentation discussion regarding ASBA equity challenge. Welcome. I'm sorry, Anita Gomez, right? Yes. Thank you. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board. Thank you for having me tonight. I am Anita Gomez. I work under the direction of Wendy Davey in our research assessment and planning department. And I've, I'm here to talk about the Arizona School Boards Association Equity Challenge. You've received the report about it. I'm going to give a broad summary. Oh, and it works, kind of. It's not quite centered. Stephen, can you fix that? Oh, thanks. 
So this year, the president of ASBA issued a challenge to all the Arizona school boards to look deeper into the demographics and information about the students that they serve. And it was supported here when it was initiated in July, and the research department has been working on that. We've compiled information and data for this project, so feel free, I talk fast, so feel free to interrupt me at any time. So there's five steps to this project, and they're listed here. Um, each question, each bullet has its own set of questions, and um, we worked on finding data that answered each of those questions and then analyzing to come up with a summary for each. So part one was called, is called Define Equity Within the Community, and you can see the list of things that uh, we needed to do to prepare to answer this question. So we wanted to define what our student subgroups are in relation to the general data that's kept on students in Arizona and across the nation. And then we looked for information that we can compare, compare ourselves to in Maricopa County, Arizona, and throughout the country. So this is what we found for part one, that there are discussions that principals have on campus that are very formal. There are sometimes special training, guest speakers, um, book studies, learning uh, teams that discuss these things. But really what happens most when it comes to equity in schools and talking about what's, uh, what are the supports that the students need are based on individual conversations that happen throughout the school day, that happen frequently in IEP meetings and staff meetings and casual conversations where one teacher is asking another for support and then they seek out the right person on campus to get the best information. But there's that constant discussion, um, especially now with personalized learning, is really focusing on what are the needs of every student, each one individually. So part of the project, uh, it, with each part, there's five, um, ASBA makes some suggestions for the district uh, and the school board, our governing board, to consider. And these are written verbatim. I copy them right out of the document. Okay, the second part, getting familiar with your demographics. There's a lot of data from very a lot of sources. We have a lot of data that we keep with uh, students' achievement and personal information that we can get into those demographics and really look to see how we stand in comparison to um, Arizona as a whole, Maricopa County, um, and also throughout the nation. And our Arizona Auditor General's uh, website is very handy for those types of things. But this is what we looked at for part two. So what we found is that our district, Peoria Unified School District, is on par with many state and national percentages. We are on average for low-income families, um, ethnicity subgroups, and special education. Our district has about a third of the Maricopa County average for English learning students, and that compared, comparing our teachers to those across the nation, Again, we're very close within a year of average age, years of experience, and also proficiency. So there's lots in here. I have a question about ELL students. So mm -hmm. are, we, are we at 10, could you go back? Did that say we're, I'm not sure. we're 10 spots? <laughs> the arrow. 10 points bring me back. lower than the average on e number of ELL students? Is that because we start with fewer ELL students, or is that because they achieve so quickly that they test out? We have had consistently that amount of students over. It's been holding steady. I wrote that on there for the last five years. I'm surprised. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Any other, that same slide, I believe. There's, oh, sorry. I moved it. Uh, let's see if I can get to that real quick. Actually, it wasn't that one. It was one, I think it was bullet number two, that states that uh, our district is in line with our state, city, county. Yes, thank you. Um, what, can you define that a little further? Because, um, you know, I'm aware of, you know, Monica spoke earlier about the Hispanic space in, in the state of Arizona City, certainly county. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly growth um, and, and about 30% in the county. I know in the district, 
you know, we're not at that level. So can you just further explain that bullet a little bit? Mm -hmm. you want to look? So for student ethnicity in our district, we have 34%, and that's very close to what is showing per, as an average in Maricopa County. Not all counties throughout Arizona, but this is the information that I had found. I have the Gotcha, so ethnicity, just overarching ethnic groups, is that correct? Yes. Okay, not specific to any individual no. ethnic group, got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Jumped ahead. You want to back me up just one? One slide. The ASBA recommendations are listed on the previous slide, but you've seen that before, so I'll just continue with part three. Part three is called Dig into Your Data and Identify Opportunities for Improvement. We used a lot of our achievement data for our students to analyze any place that we thought there would be room or some things that seem to be a priority, more so than something else. But our school net is our student information system, and I use that to make a lot of summaries and to make some comparisons with state and national. The Helios Foundation I mentioned in the report is a grant that helps us provide the um, ACT test to all of our juniors, which is fantastic. Okay, so this, I mentioned first in here about achievement gaps in our state and national level test. And this is something that I read a lot of research about. And what's interesting is there's lots of attempts to discover why, but the results are always riddled with uncertainty as to all the different things that can affect how a student does at school. It's very difficult to attribute or pinpoint exactly what uh, may bring and uh, the scores of an ethnic group down below another. Like, why is it panning out like that? And there's been many, many studies done on even the relationships students have with uh, their teachers, with relationships to same um, ethnicity teachers. So like my teacher and I would have the same race, those types of things, and looking for what might Im influence. And there's just not anything that is strong enough to change how we look at staffing, or really what we can change with the applicants and the amount of applicants we have in Arizona, or the nation right now with teaching and the climate that it's in. Teacher performance, though, I mean classroom performance. So the, the works that teachers do in class, though, take away or minimize that achievement gap. So you'll see in the, in the report I gave to you that there are gaps between ethnicities and and how they performed in ACT and as merit. Not so much in the class, and that is attributed really to the excellent work our teachers do. So what's happening in the classroom is that that effect um, is minimized because they're teaching to these kids as kids. So with the, the effect of a semester's worth of work or even a year's worth, those kinds of differences aren't seen. When you look at our GPA data, you won't see that those big gaps are very small compared to the results of our ACT and as merit. So teachers are really good at teaching kids and making sure everyone has been taken care of. And that is obvious in our GPAs and all the way down to first grade. I mean, it's amazing. So it's nice to see. And that was a big takeaway from this group. We also, um, High schools provide an incredible amount of clubs, almost like 40 per high school, and then there's many uh, available as well at the elementary level. So there's lots of leadership opportunities, which is important for our kids. And um, this was, there's just so much. In, in this section in the report, you notice there's a lot of charts. Okay, so for part three, digging into the data, there's ASBA has some suggestions on the next slide. I'm gonna stop, oh, thank you, I'm gonna stop clicking. <laughs> thank you.
Okay. Those are recommendations from the Arizona School Board Association for three. You want to click or me? I'm not sure what to do. You want to do it? Okay. Part four. So for this section, we um, had a principal survey to collect anecdotal information about the practices that principals have at their school regarding um, awareness and culture activities on their individual campuses. And we also worked with the HR department to get some teacher demographics so that we can compare those with state averages and also the state standards. Because this question um, is talking about cultural curriculum. And how is that covered? Well, it's interesting because in high school level courses, there is a lot of that in the language courses, but really in it, there's bits and pieces of it throughout the K-12 curriculum in the English language, I mean, sorry, the ELA or the language arts portion with the reading and different activities like that. But there, it's not, it's not just there that students get exposed to how different cultures affect our lives here in America and in the history of other cultures that comes to social studies, art, um, science. And they come in bits and pieces, but they're very informative and they're deliberate, and, but they support other standards. So while I'm teaching a topic on science, I'm also talking about other cultures that influenced where that item came from. So there's an overlap really of how the information is coming through about other cultures through the curriculum in K-12. And there's a lot of information that was gathered from principals about how they encourage students to talk about their own experiences in their family. It helps build the group. It helps build a positive climate in the class talking about other cultures that all of us have come from. Keeps jumping, sorry. There, there it is. So these are the ASBA suggestions for this section. Okay, finally, this is my favorite part, student voice. And student voice has brought up, been brought up even tonight. Um, <clears throat> so we talked, uh, Wendy and I had used information from our survey. We used a lot of information from the survey that was given to students in this, um, just this past spring. And we also talked to assistant principals about what activities are provided, opportunities at their school for students to have leadership positions, be in sports and different clubs and things like that. So the issue with, the thing that's great about student voice is you don't really have to go looking for it. It's, it's everywhere. Um, I've been, I was a teacher for 16 years and I was a principal for 11. And no matter where you are, you're in line at lunch, you're out at duty, you're walking down the hall, teachers absorb, all the time. Students give information to their teachers and the adults on campus constantly. So you have that exchange and sometimes when you have a survey it just seems a little not as genuine, you may not get as much information out of it, sorry. But that's what we looked at. What are, do we have students that are sharing and expressing their voices? And what I found is that, yes, they feel like they've be, been heard. And this is all demographics are reporting in the survey. They feel like they have been heard. Principals report that they will have purposeful meetings with groups like NJHS at the high school, student government, or they will go out on lunch duty and talk to kids. They'll be between classes, talk to kids. And even as they're observing their teachers, they'll talk to kids. Um, teachers do that. Coaches do that. Special ed uh, teachers especially work with students so that they make sure that they're advocating for themselves and speaking up when they need help. So anything that a principal can do to support, or a teacher, or a coach, or someone working at the front desk or covering duty is going to want to build that culture and climate of the, of the school because that changes from year to year. It ebbs and tides, there's student needs change and having that constant flow of information is important. Sorry, it skipped. And the last, whoops, sorry, the last two recommendations from the Arizona School Board Association is here. And this would include my very fast and broad summary for you. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer. Otherwise, I'm done. Uh, Mrs. Connect. 
Well, sure. Thank you for all this data. We, uh, we were given a ton of data, um, and and I'm hesitant to ask for more work being done on this, but I think it's really important work. So um, l let me be more specific about maybe how you could help us see some of the questions that I have, and maybe my colleagues have some other questions too. Sure. Um, so we, each school has pages and pages, so it's hard to get a snapshot. Of course, when we, we look at equity, what we're trying to do is ensure that each student has an equal opportunity to be successful, regardless of his or her neighborhood or his or her uh, uh, ethnicity or socioeconomic status, that every kid is getting what he or she needs to be successful, right? We're all in agreement on that. Um, and so what we're looking for, and maybe maybe some um, more work on working with the, the data would be helpful, is are there gaps, are there trends um, that we should be made aware of because we might be needing to put more resources towards those areas. For example, in discipline, if we have, if we have 30% of our student population are um, white, then probably it shouldn't be 15% of, of the white kids are being disciplined, right? There should be some, some equal equilibrium there, right? So that the number of kids in each, in each subgroup is equally or closely represented in discipline. That's just one example. So being able to look at that, and, and in, my, in my thinking, we don't need to be shown every single school. We just need to know if there's an issue, and then we can address how, we can talk about how to address that issue. Um, same thing with um, achievement. Are there, any, are there any schools or subsets of students or areas, um, maybe it's in math, that kids aren't achieving? How do we, how do we as a board, look at that and say, hmm, maybe we need more a new tutoring program at, the, at, at this school or with that subset of students so that every kid is getting what they need to succeed. And I think while the, all this data is good, it's a little overwhelming for us. And I always um, have, have, a, have a lot of faith in our administration and our teachers that if there is something, if we're looking at this and something is, is saying, wait, we do have a gap here, that those are the things that I'd like to have brought to our attention. Make sense? Actually, I'm going to go to um, uh, Mr. Sandoval. This was your, your topic. I should have st started off with you. I apologize. No, uh, th thank you. No, not at all. I mean, this is, uh, I agree with Ms. Connect. I mean, our, as a board, um, you know, our overall goal is 100% focused on the 37,000 plus, um, you know, students, youth that we have in our district. Uh, there's a lot of data, <laughs> without question, but uh, to kind of uh, piggyback on what Ms. Connect was saying, um, you know, it's how we humanize these numbers, right? Truly humanize these numbers. I'm looking at one of the, um, the, the files that I opened up because, you know, when you take a look at the, the titles of them, you know, some are just demographics, um, enrollment, et cetera. You know, uh, this one has a question on, you know, do the students and clubs reflect the same diversity, uh, ethnicity, gender, economic disadvantaged uh, as a student population? And the answer was just overall yes. Um, so and I think, you know, well, that's, you know, uh, certainly, a, I, I guess for me, you know, it makes me happy that yes, overall, uh, yes, that the uh, diversity is, is pretty much the same across all the clubs. But, you know, what does that really mean, right? And when we take a look at our numbers as a district, um, we take a look at our grad rates, our dropout rates, you know, well, you know, maybe um, weighted by certain sites. I mean, you know, there are sites that, uh, you know, don't, you know, have that same level of, you um, uh, grad rate, if you will, or, or dropout rate, and you know, and I think where Kathy was headed, uh, misconnect. Apologize. Um, is you know, really again, and I've always said it. Um, you know, how we take these numbers, humanize them, and understanding that every site has its own story, um, and uh, understanding you know where the priorities uh, truly exist and lie, and and um, and what resources we have where we don't have to reinvent the wheel. 
but um, you know what uh, opportunities we have to broaden our bandwidth, if you will, by uh, leveraging the expertise of um, you know other organizations that are out there. Um, you know, from a Hispanic space, you've got the CPLCs of the world. But when you talk about behavioral health, you know we got Southwest Behavioral and Taros, right? So all of that, um, you know, taking a look at a, just a an understanding of um, truly how all this information is coming in, right? So I, I know. It's, it's important for everybody at the site level to have really solid, good relationships, um, you know, with, with our students. And that's important, you know, from an uh, overall success of our youth. But, you know, as they're asking the question and getting a response, um, you know, how that, where, where does all that go, right? Um, you know, when they have that real tangible, sometimes courageous dialogue, um, you know, with, with uh, our students, um, you know, how's that information, um, I guess, I don't want to say registered, but, you know, what, what's done at that point, um, you know, to uh, um, support, you know, certainly, I guess, the diversity uh, of our sites. Um, the, I guess for me, it, it truly becomes, how do we take all this, pare it down, phase it out, and, 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 and truly make sure that as a district, from a competency perspective, that not only our existing, our veteran, um, you know, teachers and staff, but those as we onboard, you know, those those new teachers and staff members at at, at a school, um, how do we ensure that they're successful um, as they you know enter a campus you know, to truly understand um, the dynamics, if you will, um, of of those particular schools? Um, I think that's important as well. But um, I mean, again, at the end of the day. Um, there, there's, there's so much to consider, uh, even as we um, engage um, and uh, include the, the parents, you know, of our students, and understanding um, that and, and the language barriers, et cetera. And I know I'm going in on and on, but uh, there's, I would agree, just trying to figure out how we pare this down and, and phase it out to, to make sure that we are absolutely addressing the needs of you know, all of our students. You know, again, I always talk about our mantra, it's every student every day. Um, I think this, the face of our student population is continuing to shift, um, you know, on, a, on a, a daily basis. You know, one of the things that I wanted to see is, well, we understand our diversity today, you know, what was it 10 years ago so we can understand a trend and stay ahead of that, right? So what's coming around the corner? Um, it, <laughs> the challenge is gonna be how we really kind of bring all this together, reel it in. Um, and make sense of it, humanize it, um, and, uh, and and get started. Truly, I mean, it's, well, I don't know. There's just there's a lot you know, for sure, and, and, it's a, and it's a great it's overwhelming. And it's, a, and it's a great start, Ms. Gomez. It really is. Yeah, without question. But I mean, some of the outcomes that might happen for this yeah. are, for example. Um, we know which teachers have the most experience. We know which teachers have had the most success, right? And really, in my mind, those teachers should be working with the students who are experiencing the most challenges. Yeah. That's a good example to me of putting our resources where, um, where they have the most need. And that's just one of the kinds of things that we might come up with. Yeah, and I think even a, a possible outcome would be, you know, when you talk about resources and teachers and, you know, uh, how do we, you know, even you know, influence those um, those those high caliber teachers, you know, when you talk about stipends and, and teaching, you know, at, uh, at those schools that truly have a need, um, you know, for that level of uh, instruction, you know, not to minimize or, or discount, you know, any teacher at all within our district, but, um, you know, when we talk about, you know, equity, um, you know, let's make sure that every student, you know, is, is certainly realizes that the district continues to uphold the promise of public schools, right? You know, which is high caliber teaching and, and rigorous curriculum, you know, regardless of what zip code they live in. So, you know, how do we realize that? And even from a resource standpoint, finance, you know, uh, you know, just, um, you know, from a, a stipend perspective, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to say rewarding, but certainly, um, I guess, uh, paying, you know, those, uh, those individuals uh, to, uh, um, to take on those, um, you know, those seats and, uh, you know, and put those students, you know, in a, uh, a path of success. So what I don't want to do, and, and what I'm not saying at all, is I'm not minimizing all everything that you've done. There, there's a lot of work that's been done here, and I really appreciate it, and it's a great starting point. Now, it's, now that the work, you know, begins, 
right? Um, you know, let's take this um, and uh, you know again apply it, you know, to our to our to PUSD. Mr. Sandoval, um, Mrs. Connect, I want to make sure I am heading in the right direction. I'm not sure if I need to back up and give big picture, specifically statistics, just about the district as a whole, or do I need to consult with our building administrators and teachers and have some specifics about each building? Because they're very different. You mentioned the human level, uh, that human connection, the important part of relationships on a campus, and they're very different. Um, so I'm. Which, how would you like for me to move forward I th um, to get more information? Do you mind if I jump in? Jump in. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Ms. Pingarelli. Uh, first, thank you for all this time and data for the whole staff. Um, I'm going to focus on three things. One, um, I appreciate you providing all this data so the public can see it as we continue to look at developing up north, trends, um, and two call to actions for our HR department to look at our hiring practices proportionate to the information provided that it serves those in the classroom and looking at our leadership. It looks like at first glance I saw that the majority of our district is women. Do the leadership seats serve that? Is it proportionate? Straight off the bat, just looking at our hiring practices and make sure they're in line to the law so that everybody has an opportunity uh, to serve at all levels. Uh, the second thing, and uh, Mrs. Connect and uh, Mr. Sandoval, and we've had some speakers talk about resources and equity, and we are getting ready to gear up for our bond conversation. So this data is essential and influential on the decisions that we make on the bond um, that we ask for the community and say, here is factual data, here are the disproportionate statistics that our students down south are not meeting their peers to the north or the west or the east and we need to provide the extra support in a bond and this is what I'm asking for. So just straight off the bat, I appreciate the data because it's going to help drive the conversation when we go out for a bond. It's going to help uh, our hiring practices with HR when we look at those to serve all our students and it's definitely transparency for our public. Thank you. Oh. Mrs. Doan. Well, I would say there's a lot here to work with, and I don't think um, I don't think it's uh, beyond us to figure out what's going on. It's it is a difficult situation sometimes. Um, sometimes the money's not there for more than equality. Sometimes we're going to have to shift. Um, I think that um, possibly talking with principals would would be good, and maybe we could invite some to address the board. Um, I think that we, as a board, probably need time to study this more. I mean, you know, it's gonna it's gonna be an ongoing thing. Um, I liked the um, discipline. Um, uh, demographics by ethnic code that was pretty good that's very detailed and um, the there's there's just there's more information in here than we're going to get through in a week or two to to put it together to collate it in our minds and even on paper um, I'm very appreciative I think that uh, we want to be careful we don't short anybody and that You know, everybody is given the same. Uh, it, we have we have um, donations to s certain schools for technology, and then they just that's their money, and they have that. And this is this is an area where um, we're probably going to need to find a way to fill in, because uh, the schools, especially in the South, as Monica mentioned, are not getting those donations so much because it's it's not the same income level, uh, but I think that uh, this is a really, really good start and a good, a good, a good way to go. I think that um, perhaps what Mr. Sandoval was talking about, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that um, 
we really want to see if there is disadvantage to some groups in some schools. A lot of it would be, um, a lot of it would probably be the socioeconomic areas, and some of it might be ethnic. Um, I think I think that would be the first area we want to hit, you know. Like your um, any disparity in our schools with uh, regards to socioeconomic or or ethnic ability to reach their success. You know, I think this is a really positive thing in that what this board is saying is that we want to ensure that we're doing right by all kids. Absolutely, and that's a really good thing. Um, I, I brought two things. Two things have come across my desk, and I'll give them to one of our, uh, maybe Diane, so maybe in future packets you can share this. Um, one is a speaker I recently saw from the Pacific region, and he's a superintendent who had um, an Asian uh, adopted brother and uh, who, who had a very, very difficult time, and how he learned from that experience how to address the needs of students who don't always feel like they fit in. And it's a very moving story with some very concrete um, examples of, of things that teachers and administrators and school board members can do to help ensure that kids feel like, all kids feel like they belong. Um, and then this one is um, a document uh, released by the Arizona Superintendent of Public Instruction. And it's about culturally inclusive practices. Uh, and it's an implementation guide for local, for, for schools and school districts. So um, I don't know if our administrators have probably seen this already, but um, take a look at that and maybe share that with our school board members. And then this as well, I'd appreciate that. I think they might find it useful. Okay. All right. oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, Beth. So really quick, and, and it might have been said in, in my absence, but uh, I mean, I, I would agree. I think, you know, fundamentally, you know, our, our charge is to, to ensure the success of the 37,000 plus, right? Um, both academically and socially. So I think if we take a look at where our, our opportunities exist as a district and to, to take a deep dive um, at those site levels um, and, and begin there, with, certainly without, um, um, you know, not impeding on the success, you know, of the students who are thriving and, and um, you know, and, are, are certainly talented and gifted, right? Um, but you know, maybe that's you know we kind of start at those site levels um, and uh, and grow from there. Uh, so um, yeah, I, I, I think everything that everybody said certainly it is um, you know inspiring, and um, you know that uh, we're all uh, focused on the same thing, which is ensuring the success uh, the success of every student uh, every day. So. Thank you again. Uh, to answer the how done. question, can I just summarize? I think Mrs. Dome put the, put, had the best idea. Ask the principals. What do your student populations need and where can we help? Sounds great. Yeah, and I think if you take a look at this, I mean, what outcome are you looking for here this evening? I mean, I think it, this is going to impact so many things, right? Not only the success of our kids, but systems, um, potentially curriculum, um, you know, uh, some of the stuff that I believe I heard Monica saying before I, I stepped out. Um, you know, it's it's going to affect a lot. You know, for sure. Um, so, anyway, at however we can help uh, you, uh, we're certainly supportive. Um, but again, I appreciate uh, you know all the uh, certainly uh, comprehensive and uh, due diligence that you did to capture this data. Thank you very much, Ms. Gomez. It's it's hard to. Uh, uh, add anything on to the discussion tonight. So I'm glad I'm at the end. So uh, I will just say thank you very much for coming in the presentation. All right, next agenda item. And I'm glad we didn't do that last board meeting. We would have been here till midnight. Uh, it would be report and discussion on local, state, and federal legislative issues and activities. Uh, Mr. Hicks. Uh, Madam President, members of the board, just a few quick things. Um, you may or may not know um, that the Arizona Department of Education had an error in their federal funding as a result of an audit. So you probably heard about that or heard or seen uh, Superintendent Diane Douglas's response. 
Um, of course, Peoria uh, was included in that and also um, huge error, but the, ho the hope is that it's a hold harmless. So there, yes, we were over allocated funds. There's an article, I think, in the Capital Times indicating it uh, all true, and we are hoping that the feds accept that recommendation for the hold harmless because that would have a huge impact on the district. Also uh, going on next week is the Arizona Town Hall on pre-K through 12 uh, school funding. I was invited to participate in that, so I'll be part of the panel working on that. I've never been part of a town hall before. Um, these official, I think it's every two years they get together to do this process and pick a topic, so it'll be interesting uh, to be part of that. I think I've already alluded to um, next year, uh, the JLBC, that's the Joint Legislative Budget Committee, has already put out a projection of approximately $100 million deficit for the state that they're in for next year, starting next year's budget process. Um, I would uh, advocate anybody, if you have the time and ability, um, I know it's short notice, but the ASBA, ASA, ASBO, the ASBO legislative workshop next, um, next Friday. Um, Richard Stavnik, who's the director of the JLBC, um, normally gives a presentation. He starts with just the whole budget outlook, how he gets to that. I know it gets into some numbers and forecasts. It's really interesting because it really does set the tone for the next two months prior to the governor coming out with his budget that will be in January, the beginning of the January. So um, that is a good conference workshop to go to if you're going to that next Friday. And that's it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, anything from any board member? This connect's gone, okay. Um, then the uh, next agenda item. Request for agenda items. Uh, where are we at? 7.6. Uh, future agenda items for the governing board meetings. Mrs. Um, Connect, or Mrs. Uh, I saw Mrs. Connect come in. Mrs. Pangrelli, I believe there are two uh, that we wanted to bring back is uh, the HA policy. Right. Oh, I will agree with that. Wait, wait, wait. I thought we were well, it's just a later. It's oh, for the, uh, okay. the future. Okay, not next meeting. Not next meeting. Okay. No, 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 no. So we could put it back on the agenda. Um, you said there are two. And the second one, it sounds to me like we need a study session on all the demographics uh, that were provided. I believe that this format is not conducive to a good right. dialogue conversation. So when we dis when we find out the trends of the equity challenge, we start to look at that, that we put that on the table, that we have a study session to look at those trends so we can have round table discussion. Another thing is I was interested in what Mr. R Romero had to say. Um, and I was wondering if Mr. Romero could, um, if you know of other school districts who have such a resolution, if you could get that to us so we could take a look at it and see if it would be something we wanted to apply here. President Pingarelli, Pingarelli and members of the board, yes. <clears throat> I don't know the specifics, but I do know there has been other school districts around the country. Um, resolutions passed, and I, mm -hmm. I could be wrong, but I believe the Phoenix Union High School District either has one currently or is working on one right now. Or, yeah, was working on one right now. Bolt, but I can get that information back to you. Bolts has one, too, that they just Bolt. did pass. Yes. Okay. So if you so have any questions. someone on administration maybe find something like that? Okay. And um, there's another... And in that article that I provided about um, equity from leadership through an equity lens, they talked to about you know uh, school boards ensuring that campuses are a place where students feel safe, and so that's related, I think, as well. So, does anyone else want to see that? Well, I'll say yes to Monica's, and then yeah, okay. and I'll say yes to Kathy's. Um, yeah. <laughs> <Y> yes. <laughs> Future uh, agenda yeah, items. Uh, actually, what uh, Monica was, I wanted to definitely have a follow up on the uh, the equity and certainly all the data. And uh, I agree that um, you know this uh, format is not conducive to really digging in the weeds a little bit um, and uh, and coming out with an outcome that uh, you know is going to benefit the district from a holistic perspective. So, okay. yeah. uh, Mrs. Doan, do you have any? I think I'm going to let well enough lie for now. I have some fomenting, but 
I'm going to leave them off for a we, little while. That's fine. We'll try to get through these first. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then I have a, um, I think this is a proper uh, place to, to put this at. Um, we need to uh, <clears throat> have a uh, executive session and a um, uh, an open meeting next week. And I just wanted to try to get some dates and times um, just while we're all here together and we can talk about it. Um, I know Mrs. Connect. I think you said Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are, is out. That's correct. Um, okay. I'm just trying to get the, the time just down so we can. Um, uh, Thursday is out for um, our attorney. Uh, so it leaves Friday. Um, the earliest that can we can get together on Friday. Yeah, I, 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 I thought it was Friday at 2. That's what it's, I have. It's been kind of I can't moved. do 2. I can get here at 4. I leave Scottsdale at 3 o'clock. I was just wanting to do it now because Diane's been on the phone quite a bit today. <laughs> and I appreciate it, but I thought this would be much easier. I can do every other day, but... I understand. So four four o'clock on Friday. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, for me, I was I was good. Five, five. Right. Sorry, I was good with five on Friday. So four works as well. Yeah. Um, We're still looking at Friday the seventeenth. I apologize for not being able to make it on Monday or Tuesday. Um, but I'm representing the school boards association at the town hall. And it is in Mesa, and um, so can't make it. Well, that's understandable. Uh, so the earliest then would be Friday at four o'clock. Good. That works for everybody. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, that's that's all I have on that one. Um, next agenda item. Uh, budgets, facilities, planning, and construction reports. And these can be, this one can be looked at and on our website, but you can pull it up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next agenda item. Budget report, uh, where are we at? Uh, are we on 8-2? Budget report, uh, month of September 2017. And next one. District enrollment um, report uh, for month of September 2017. And all of these can be looked at, found on our website for anybody interested in going through them in detail. Thank you very much. Uh, next item is reports on upcoming meetings and events. All right. Thank you very much. And the last one, uh, draft agenda for December 7th, uh, 2017 board meeting. Thank you. Can I ask a question about yes. the, about, uh, you just went by the uh, the art exhibit, Mr. Panzer, the art exhibit at City Hall? Nope, sorry. No? Did I, I see didn't, that? I didn't. That's okay. Is there an, there's an art exhibit at the City Hall? Can you go back is to there the... A, uh, is there a reception associated with that? There is. President Pegarelli, members of the board. Uh, there is an upcoming exhibition. We have a partnership with the City of Peoria. Um, and we do an exchange program with our artwork over to the mayor's office, um, and she hosts a reception. That is going to be taking place on December 12th. Um, the artwork is currently on display right now in the Pine Room in City Hall. Uh, we have about uh, 12 of our schools represented currently, and we'll have about another 12 in the spring uh, represented. But on December 12th, there will be a reception. I believe it starts at uh, 6 o'clock uh, and then at 7 o'clock. All of the students who are involved with that will actually be publicly recognized at a city council meeting uh, for the city of Peoria. So it's a wonderful event. So certainly would love to have all of you there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. 
All right. Um, last agenda item is for adjournment. I move that we adjourn the meeting. Okay, members, please cast your vote. Mm. Oops. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> I think I closed it too soon. I closed it too soon. Can I just say aye? You can, say, can okay. yeah, Miss Connect, give an aye. Oh, she, she's got it, I think. It passes 5 0. All right, we'll see you here next board meeting and, or next Friday. Thank you.